see them. <laughs> Thank you very much, Vanessa. That's that's very helpful. So um, what I wanted to start with uh, is to draw your attention perhaps to the fact that uh, data protection and privacy are not the same thing. Uh, the GDPR is strictly about data protection. Privacy is a somewhat related concept, but it's not exactly the same thing. Uh, privacy is protected by, by a wide range of rules um, in the Napoleonic Code, so in France and in the countries that uh, adopted similar uh, civil codes inspired by the Napoleonic Code. There is a special uh, provision in the civil code uh, that protects privacy um, but when you think about it, uh, data protection rules are about uh, protecting information about the person and this information does not necessarily have to um, refer to the, the, the private sphere of life of the individual. So um, the fact that someone is a researcher at Institut für Deutsche Sprache in Mannheim, like me, uh, it is not a private information because it refers to the public sphere of my activities, uh, but it's nonetheless uh, personal data. And vice versa, uh, you can violate one's privacy without uh, processing an information about him, for example, simply by knocking at uh, his or her door or, or entering his or her apartment uninvited. Um, so um, I hear it a lot. The GDPR is about data privacy. GDPR is about privacy. Um, and this is not exactly the case. So uh, I would, for today, I would like us to set privacy aside and focus on uh, data protection, really the processing of information that relates uh, to um, living individuals. Um, and Walter, uh, perhaps you'll tell us something about uh, the GDPR. What, what's, what's this? What is it? Um, yeah, exactly. Um, hi, uh, I'm Walter. Uh, Pavel and Vanessa have already uh, introduced me to you, so I'll pick right up. Um, we were already mentioning the GDPR a couple of times. GDPR translates to General Data Protection Regulation, and it was passed as a regulation of the European Union um, in April 2016 and has been in force uh, as of May 25, 2018. Now, the important thing about um, a regulation versus a directive is that a regulation actually becomes directly applicable and enforceable law in the European Union and the European Economic Area uh, when it takes effect, so in this case 2018, uh, whereas a directive um, is a legal act of the European Union which still requires member states to achieve the results that are pointed out in the directive uh, without dictating the means of achieving it. So basically there is a lot more leeway, there is a lot more flexibility uh, for member states uh, regarding a directive because they have to take the directive and then implement it in their national legislation. Now, having said that, of course, also with a regulation, there are certain things that need to be implemented in the National uh, Data Protection Acts. And there have been amendments in pretty much every uh, European country since then. Uh, Pavel will probably know more about these details. Uh, the important thing about the GDPR legislation is that it is not retroactive. So it does not apply on any processing of data because that's what it's all about. That happened before May 25, 2018. It does, however, apply to data processing ever since, even if the data was collected before that date. So that's very important, uh, but it is not retroactive. Um, apart from clearing what the GDPR actually means, or general data protection regulation means, uh, there are a number of basic concepts which we want to introduce to you. So the first one is probably uh, switching back to Pavel about what it is all about. So what is what do we mean when we talk about personal data and processing, actually? Because yes, that's so what the GDPR is. The GDPR is all about the processing of personal data. So what is personal data? Personal data is uh, any information about an identifiable, uh, I'm sorry, about an identified or identifiable uh, natural person. 
so this information can be split into a number of uh, elements. First of all, it's N information. So regardless of its form, whether it's analog or digital, whether it's video, audio, text. Um, so something written on a piece of paper can be personal data and uh, the digital information in a, in, a, in a digital file can be personal data uh, as well. Uh, but also from this end information element, you can get that uh, it's um, um, personal information is protected regardless of uh, its content. So whether, no matter if it's a fact or an opinion or whether it's true uh, or false, if uh, someone writes something that is false about a living individual, it's still uh, personal data. If someone writes uh, an opinion about a living intellectual, uh, I'm sorry, a living individual that is not necessarily true, it's still uh, personal data. Now this personal data has to relate to uh, an identified or identifiable person. A person is uh, uh, identified if it's singled out from a group, is this one, this, this fellow there. Um, or identifiable if it is possible uh, to identify either via a, a name or an ID number uh, or by a unique combination of uh, various elements. Is when you think about it, most names or even most names and surnames uh, are not um, um, directly identifiable because there are several persons with the same name and surname. So you need extra information, you need date of birth, you need hometown to, um, to uh, really identify, single out the person. And, and this can be any information, any combination of uh, such uh, elements. So for instance, if you have a speaker or a translator of a uh, under-resourced language, a language that has very few speakers and even fewer translators uh, who lives in Berlin, for example, that in itself uh, can be um, enough to identify the person because there is only one translator of this uh, language um, in, in Berlin. Uh, and then the definition also contains this natural person element. What's a natural person? Well, a natural person is a legal way of saying a living individual. Um, so there are, there's no personal data for companies and there is no, normally, no data protection for the deceased, although there might be some uh, special rules about that in some uh, member states. France famously has a framework for protecting uh, data of, of the deceased. And this is increasingly something that member states will address uh, with uh, social media and what to do with information in social media after um, after um, uh, the death of, of, the, of the person. Um, and um, yes, so um, also an information about uh, a dead person can be, uh, can refer to uh, its family who is still alive, his or her family. Uh, members. Uh, for example, information that a person died of uh, a rare disease may have an impact on um, how the family members are, are treated with regards to, for example, capacity to get credit, um, etc. Now, that is a complex definition, arguably, um, but it, it is really very, very broad. Processing is also very broad and it's simpler. Processing is anything you can do uh, with data, and that includes storage, and that inclu includes uh, erasure, that includes anonymization. It's really anything uh, you do uh, with uh, the data. And the uh, person that data relates to, this, this living individual I mentioned, um, is called a data subject. And uh, I leave the floor to uh, Walter for the definition of the data subject and other stakeholders in data processing. Uh, yes, indeed. So now that we've learned about 
personal data. So what is personal data and what is processing, which is pretty much everything you can think of doing with that kind of data. Uh, the other thing is to clear the roles that are defined in the GDPR. Uh, we're going to look some more at the principles of the GDPR, also of the rights of individuals uh, under the framework of the GDPR uh, in a couple of minutes. So it's important to know the lingo that is involved with the whole thing. Uh, and that also uh, refers to the roles that are defined in this legal text. So basically there are three different roles that are differentiated based on the placement of the individual in the data processing, basically. Um, so the data subject, starting with, with the most personal thing, because data subject is basically what we are all the time, uh, whenever our data is processed, is the identified or identifiable natural person, Pavel already uh, explained that concept, uh, whose data is being processed. So the subject that the data refers to. Um, which, as I said, is us for the most part um, in, in many, many uh, operations. But very often, especially in a research context, we would also be, well, at least partially the controller. Um, having said that, the controller um, is the one, the party that determines both the purpose and the means of the data processing. Um, that can be a natural person, it can also be a legal person, it might be a public authority or some other body. So um, also this role can be held by more than one party, and we speak of joint controllers. Um, in the most common research settings, usually we are, as individual researchers, employed by a research institution or a cultural heritage institution, and this institution will be the controller since they are actually our, our boss. Uh, and usually this is dealt with by the institutions. As an individual researcher who conducts their own surveys, you might as well be the controller of the data you process if there is no institution behind it. Um, so in my case, for example, uh, if I collect um, your data for attending this workshop, um, the University of Graz as my employer and as the one who basically pays for me to do these workshops uh, would be the controller of that data. Um, then the second role or the intermediate between these roles, the controller and the data subject uh, is the processor. That's a natural legal person, again, authority, agency, et cetera, et cetera, which processes personal data on behalf of the controller. Um, which also means that this role is not always filled. Sometimes in the data processing of personal data situation, you will only have a controller and the data subject. But as soon as any operations are outsourced, basically, um, there is a processor in place um, who conducts these operations on behalf of the controller, um, which has certain repercussions on, on responsibilities and stuff like that. But since this is a workshop on, on us as researchers or as data subjects uh, and not about uh, data protection officers, we will not cover that in any land um, because that's a, a very different workshop then. Um, yeah, so uh, we have talked about, uh, about uh, natural persons, about identified and identifiable persons, um, which is the, the gist of, of uh, processing of personal data. Um, but uh, what are ways to actually deal with this identification or to circumvent the identification and therefore solve some problems that we have with, uh, with the data processing covered? You're still mute, Pavel. Nice thank, thank you, thank you, uh, thank you. <laughs> we had that. <laughs> uh, that's 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 a very good mean of anonymizing. Actually, turning the mic off, <laughs> uh, especially if there is no video and no name. Anyways, um, um, thank you, uh, Walter, for for uh, bringing these two issues together. It's, it's a very good point, indeed. The, the the notion of anonymization, which is a key notion in data protection, is very closely um, related to the very definition of 
uh, personal data. And you remember when I said that personal data is any information related to a person. Now, uh, the, the key uh, is in the word um, related. Now, what it, I mean, how the, 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 the information relates to a person. Well, an information relates to a person if this person uh, can be identified uh, by means reasonably likely to be used, not by any means, because, well, come to think of it, uh, everyone can be identifiable by someone somewhere using some means, right? It has to be, it, it has to be by means reasonably likely to be used. So if you have a data set and you are wondering whether the, 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 the persons that the data refer to uh, are identifiable or not. So whether your data set is to be considered as personal data or not, the question you have to ask yourself is, uh, is it possible to identify those persons by reasonable means? Okay, and uh, please note that with the technological progress, this, this uh, uh, catalog of reasonable means is getting larger and larger because perhaps soon we will have apps in our smartphones, everyone will have apps for biometric identification and you'll just take a picture of someone and you will get his personal website or, or his Facebook website. Uh, this is uh, not entirely impossible. But anyways, anonymization consists of uh, breaking the link between the data and the person so that the person is no longer identifiable by reasonable means. All right. And it's uh, data that is anonymized properly is no longer to be considered personal data and therefore is completely free from any GDPR related constraints. Uh, anonymized data can be processed freely without uh, respecting the GDPR at all. Pseudonymization, however, is something completely different. Well, very different, not completely different. Um, pseudonymization consists of um, replacing uh, the identifying elements in the data set, typically names and surnames, uh, with um, identifiers. So for instance, subject A or uh, false names. You give someone a false name, you call him Peter because you like the name Peter um, in your data set. And then uh, you retain the information that in fact, Peter or subject A is Walter Scholga in your data set. And you keep this information separately uh, in a secure environment. Uh, for instance, only on the PI's computer and all the, the annotators, all the, 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 the student uh, uh, assistants, they can only see the, the, the pseudonymized data set. This is pseudonymization. Pseudonymized data are still to be considered personal data because the information necessary to identify the person still exists and it is not uh, uh, impossible uh, to re-identify the person. However, pseudonymization can be regarded, especially in the research context, as an appropriate safeguard. And uh, appropriate safeguards are something uh, of crucial importance for research uh, under the GDPR. Walter, will you tell us more about appropriate safeguards? Um, yes, actually. So um, we are we will look into rights defined for the data subjects and also obligations or principles actually of data processing uh, in a few minutes. Um, but especially in the context of this workshop and, and the tool that we have developed, uh, it's important to remember that there are certain provisions, privileges and exceptions made uh, under the GDPR for research and similar purposes. Um, so there are academic exceptions, uh, and I put that in air quotes, um, from the controller's obligations and the data subject's rights that, uh, where these are likely to render impossible or seriously impair the achievement of the specific purpose. That's a quote from the 
Article 89 uh, of the GDPR. Article 89, you will find out, is the flagship of academic exceptions. Uh, that's basically the article that we can base a lot of um, exceptions to the data protection uh, regulation on. And it defines exceptions for archiving purposes in the public interest, for scientific or historical research purposes, or for statistical purposes. Now, I, being a historian, always wonder why there is a distinction between scientific and historical research purposes, but that's just a side note. Um, and we will look at that in, in, in some more detail. Um, now, these, these privileges, they provide us with certain advantages that a non-academic setting cannot make use of, which are very helpful, and we're going to look at that more. But all of them require appropriate safeguards, which is the, the, the term for it. Um, to be in place and such appropriate safeguards can be technical or organizational measures that can be uh, ethical measures actually um, which which tie very closely into that um, so it might be for example the pseudonymization of data as Pavel already pointed out it might be the adherence to a code of conduct which is predefined and communicated to the data subjects uh, it might be um, other measures of security for the data and for the uh, proper use of that data. <clears throat> so there's a, a fairly large, um, like these appropriate safeguards are, are not really defined, closely defined. Uh, so there is uh, some leeway to it. But the important thing is that even if we are allowed to process personal data for these purposes, research, uh, archiving, statistical purposes, um, that means we still have to act responsibly with it. So it doesn't take the responsibility for the data and for the processing from us, but to the very contrary, it just uh, encourages us and not, even, not just encourages, but requires us uh, to be extra careful about these things and to care for appropriate safeguards uh, for this data. Um, yes, sorry, Walter. Um... I think um, it's, it's important to mention that the appropriateness of the safeguards, so to say, is uh, depends on the specific case. So uh, you, you really cannot decide a priori. Uh, what you need to do is you have to kind of have a general conception of how you're going to process personal data in your project, identify the interests and rights of data subject that can be uh, in danger, and uh, think about the safeguards that uh, can be introduced to mitigate the, the risks for data subjects. Uh, and it can really vary from staff training. You will only give the data to uh, researchers who have received, have attended this workshop, for example, or have received some uh, <laughs> basic training in uh, GDPR issues. Uh, and it can be very, very advanced if you're working on really sensitive data, it can be state-of-the-art data encryption uh, so that only, so that, you know, and, and it, no researcher will really see the whole data set, they only see bits and pieces that will be encrypted and the, so the, the rest will be encrypted and they only see tiny little uh, bits um, like in a, a dystopian movie, so we, we only get little bits of and pieces of information and we don't really get the, the whole picture. Um, this is a, a possibility as well. And what these appropriate safeguards give you, they give you a lot, they give you access to uh, exceptions uh, for research, exceptions chiefly from the general principles that uh, we will talk about right now. Can you please move to the next slide? Yes, yeah, so these are the general principles of data protection in the um, GDPR. In Article 5, this is the heart of the GDPR. If you, only, if you can only read one article in the GDPR, make it Article 5. Um, it lists a number of uh, principles that apply to data processing. The first of those principles is called lawfulness. Lawfulness means that in order to comply with the GDPR, processing has to have a legal basis. Um, so legal basis, the available legal basis are listed in Article 6. There's quite a number of them. Uh, but those that are um, 
most commonly used in research are consent and legitimate interest or public interest. Now you have, I'm sorry. You have all heard, it's a phone, um, home office. Um, you have all heard about consent. Um, and I think many people still believe that uh, um, consent is always necessary to process uh, personal data under the GDPR. Uh, well, this is actually not true. There are alternatives to consent, but consent is, uh, at least in my community, in the German community, and in Walter's community, from what I know, in the Austrian com community, is uh, the, is, it should be the go-to legal basis for, uh, for your processing. Uh, now, what is consent? Consent is, um, a declaration from the data subject by which he declares his, uh, well, consent for data processing. And in order to be valid, uh, this consent has to be freely given, specific, informed, and unambiguous. Uh, without entering very much into details because we are kind of running out of time already, um, Please note that uh, consent has to be informed, which means that a, a certain number of information about the processing should be given to the data subject uh, to make his consent valid. Before con consenting, before giving consent, the data subject should know what he consents for. Uh, and um, uh, this is why you need a consent form, and this is what the consent form wizard helps you with. Um, and if you think that consent is not possible to collect or not practical to collect, you can rely on alternative uh, legal basis like legitimate interest uh, or in some countries, uh, public interest. The, the difference between the two is uh, quite important. Legitimate interest uh, relies on a simple balance of interest between your interest as a researcher and the, your your community and the, the benefits that your research can produce for uh, for your community uh, and the interest of the data subject. Now, so you simply have to make an analysis of what's more important, my research or uh, the interest of the data subject in protecting his uh, his personal data. Uh, public interest is different because there is no balancing test and it is simply based on uh, legal uh, provision that is set in, in, in the law. Uh, now in most countries, public interest I think is not really available for research, at least in my community we are not using public interest as a legal basis, uh, but legitimate interest um, by all means. So if you cannot all this to say that if you cannot collect consent, it doesn't mean that you cannot process personal data, you still can, uh, but uh, you have to rely on a different um, legal ground. All right, uh, so I'll give the floor to Walter for fairness and transparency. Um, yeah, closely tied with the lawfulness is uh, the principle of fairness and transparency. It's actually on, on the same, on the same, uh, paragraph basically. Um, so fairly on one hand means uh, what you would expect it to mean. Uh, fairness is uh, it has like data has to be processed in good faith. Uh, so both the data, the data subject can uh, reasonably uh, expect you to not abuse their data essentially or to, to use their data fairly. Uh, transparency is uh, more closely defined, a uh, transparent manner in relation to the data subject means that any information and communication relating to the processing of personal data must be on one hand easily accessible and also easy to understand. So for example, that clear and plain language is used, uh, which is often a problem uh, in, in legal contexts, probably if, if, if you have uh, dealt with such things before. Uh, that legal language is very often inaccessible to those who have not encountered it before. And in this case, uh, the provision for transparency calls for clear and easy language, uh, which any data subject can understand. 
Um, the identity of the controller, you heard about the role before, and also the purposes of the processing must be clearly communicated as well as any risks to the data processing, rules, safeguards, and rights in relation to the processing. So there has to be a very clear communication about that. And that will come back to us in a few minutes when we talk about the right to information. Um, when we talk about the, the purposes of the processing, there's some more uh, stuff to take care of. And that's something that uh, Robert will explain. Mm -hmm. So another principle is purpose limitation is very important. It says that data, personal data can only be processed for a um, clearly defined purpose and not further processed for an incompatible purpose. So if you process personal data, you have to know why. However, there is an exception for research with appropriate safeguards. If you process uh, data for research purposes or for archiving purposes with appropriate safeguards, then uh, you can reuse data that were collected for other purposes. Why? Because there is a specific provision in the GDPR that says that research and archiving are not incompatible with any other purpose. So even if it was collected for marketing purposes or for uh, the purposes of opening a bank account, research and archiving are not incompatible. So uh, as researchers, you're not really limited uh, very much by, by purpose limitation, but in order to have uh, access to this extension of, of purpose, you need to apply appropriate safeguards and you have to address th this repurposing uh, of uh, data um, in your appropriate safeguards. All right. Um, yeah, which brings us to data minimization, uh, which is a fairly easy principle to relate to probably. Uh, and that means that the data collection and processing must be limited to what is necessary in relation to the purposes for which the data are processed. Um, you will probably uh, have encountered cookies a lot of late, uh, which uh, ask you for consent to using various cookies to record all sorts of stuff when you enter a website. Uh, most of these are actually done uh, not entirely right, but that's another, another piece. Um, so uh, basically what this is about is only collect the data that you actually need for your purpose and not more than that. So if, you, if we need you to, to register for a workshop, for example, um, and especially if you are in the online audience, we have no business asking you for dietary requirements because you will not be joining us for, uh, for coffee, unfortunately. Um, so obviously we shouldn't ask you about that. Um, so obviously just uh, even, even at the collection stage, uh, you should have appropriate safeguards in place, measures in place, which refers to data protection by design and by default as well, um, that you're not even like that, that you're not even able to collect data that is of no business for the purpose that you're processing. Um, which is closely tied to storage limitation, but first let's have a look at accuracy. Yes, um, accuracy is, is a simple uh, principle that is not very important for research because it's kind of embedded in, in, in research ethics. So according to the accuracy principle, uh, personal data should be accurate, and if they are not accurate, they should be rectified. So if you have a typo in someone's name, if you have somebody's address wrong in your database, then uh, you have to rectify it or give uh, the data subject a possibility to, to rectify it. Um, of course, researchers have those who look for the truth, of course, but it's all researchers, have no business in processing inaccurate data. So uh, naturally researchers care about uh, accuracy. Um, storage limitation is uh, a, a bigger uh, principle and it's something that uh, causes much wailing and gnashing of teeth among uh, researchers uh, when I tell them that Personal data can only be stored for a limited period of time. You cannot store personal data forever. And this uh, period of time has to be limited to what is necessary 
for achieving the purpose of the processing. Um, so uh, typically if you are in a newsletter, if you are a member of a newsletter or you have an account on uh, in, in, in a website and uh, now if you are not using it, uh, you haven't used the website, you haven't used your account for, I don't know, depending on the website, two, three years, you will receive an email telling you that if you don't use it, then it will be deleted because this is the legal obligation now. They cannot keep your login data forever. However, don't worry. Uh, in the context of research and archiving, uh, with appropriate safeguards, once again, uh, personal data can be stored for longer than necessary. Uh, it doesn't really mean that it, they can be stored forever, but uh, you're not no longer um, you are no longer uh, restricted to what is strictly necessary for your research. Uh, you can also keep it for I don't know, let's say. 15, 10, 15, 20 years after the end of your research. And then it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to delete your pers the, the personal data or anonymize the personal data after this period, but at least you should uh, have a thorough review uh, whether the personal data still complies with uh, data protection principles because uh, you know with, te with technology that is evolving, um, uh, the standards of, of data protection evolve uh, as well. Bottom line, in research and archiving, you can keep uh, personal data for longer than necessary. And you ha don't have to worry that much about storage limitation, even though uh, you should try and put a number of years on the, 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 the number of years for which you will um, keep uh, the data. Uh, now, uh, there is a principle of integrity and confidentiality also known as uh, security, but it's a technical principle rather than a legal one. Um, basically, you should make efforts to prevent, uh, to protect your data from uh, unauthorized access, accidental deletion, loss of, uh, what is it called? Uh, well, I don't know because I'm not a technical person. So you should have ideally backup copies so we don't accidentally lose it. Uh, you should have, you should consider having password protection. So it's protected against uh, unauthorized access, et cetera, et cetera. But these are technical rather than legal issues. So we won't uh, talk about it much, even though it is uh, very important. And then there comes accountability, Walter. Your favorite one. Um, <laughs> uh, not, not entirely. <laughs> uh, so basically, just to pick up briefly on, on the question that, that Daria posted in chat or the, or the observation um, that uh, data minimization gets in the way of, uh, or that, yeah, that the, 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 the research exception basically gets in the way with uh, data minimization. That is true to some extent. But that means uh, data minimization is always in place. Uh, so uh, we cannot just collect any data uh, at the point where we are collecting data. That just means that if we have collected data lawfully and for, for another purpose, we can then reuse it in a research context. But we're not allowed to basically just collect any old data that we might be interested in in the future, because we're still bound by data minimization and by the purpose limitation. But as we, as Pavel pointed out before, in the research context or archiving context, we can then get back to that data that we lawfully collected for a different context and then reuse it in the research context because research is always a compatible purpose. But that doesn't mean that we can basically dispense with the, with the uh, data minimization in the first place. Uh, so accountability is again, something that is primarily important for data protection officers, I guess. Um, because it means that we have to uh, record data processing activities, we have to uh, make an impact assessment of risks that uh, can uh, occur uh, with the data processing that we're doing. Uh, but since this is actually something that should be done by the data protection offices of the institutions that were so kind to hire us, 
uh, we don't need to worry about it too much in the uh, in the context of this uh, of this workshop. But it's important to keep in mind that obviously this accountability and responsibility for the data that we are processing uh, is a very important thing to take care of, even if someone else. Uh, usually does that for us, who is uh, the data protection officer of our institution. Can we skip to the next slide, please? So uh, now come the rights of uh, data subjects, and uh, we unfortunately won't have time to enter into much uh, detail uh, about all of them. Uh, let me just tell you that uh, for our purposes, for purposes of our consent form wizard, information was by far the most important right of the data subject, and we have a special uh, slide um, on this. And there are um, other rights like access or rectification that is about giving the data subject the possibility to uh well simply access personal data about him that are being processed um this also enhances transparency because you remember the principle of transparency so indeed the processing of personal data ideally should be transparent there is rectification that is related to accuracy uh there is uh data portability an interesting right that uh, allows the data subject to request his data, uh, a copy of his data in a, a reusable format so that he can transfer it to another uh, service provider, for example. Um, not very important for research, but think about uh, online streaming services. You want to change the provider from, I don't know, Spotify to Amazon Music, so you can ask Spotify your whole history in a commonly reusable format so you can give it to Amazon and Amazon can have uh, your history so that they can uh, suggest uh, music that you are likely to uh, like. This is what portability is about. Now erasure, right to be forgotten, uh, allows the data subject to have his data deleted but only in some very, very limited circumstances, especially if it's unlawfully processed if one of the principles is, is, is violated. Um, restriction of processing, also known as uh, blocking, is kind of similar to erasure, although the data is not deleted but just blocked, so it cannot be processed without consent of the data subject uh, during a period of time. Um, also to be used only in very limited circumstances. And there is the right to object. Now you remember I actually haven't said about that and that's very important. Consent can always be withdrawn. So if data, if your, uh, the processing of your personal data is based on consent, data subject can always withdraw his consent. All right? And uh, if you decide instead to uh, choose um, legitimate interest, as the basis for your processing, then uh, the data subject has the right to object. So he can, uh, he or she uh, can uh, um, put in question uh, the analysis that you've made and say that actually, well, your purposes, my, my interests in the protection of this particular data set are actually bigger than your interest in the processing. So this is objection. Uh, however, all these, rights are very heavily limited when it comes to archiving uh, and, and academic research, especially if the exercise of these rights can uh, seriously impair uh, the, the purposes for which the data uh, were processed. If you are interested uh, in the rights of data subject, we uh, as CLARIN and the CLARIN Legal, uh, Legal and Ethical Issues Committee organized a, uh, an event about the rights of data subject and language resources specifically in March 2021. And uh, the event was recorded, uh, so you can still see it. But I will spoil it for you a little bit. Uh, the conclusion is that um, in research uh, and archiving purposes, there is very, very little left from the rights of data subjects. 
Um, all right, can you please move to the next slide? Um, so, you remember I mentioned information to be provided to data subject, the right of information. Uh, and this is really what our um, consent form wizard is all about. Um, this is a list, these bullet points, quite complicated. This is a list of uh, very simplified uh, list of information that has to be provided to the data subject um, in order for processing to be lawful. And this is regardless of whether the data is collected from the data subject or from a different source. So if you download data from uh, the internet about someone, you still have to inform this person that you processed his or her data. You, st you still have to inform him or her about your identity, your purpose, uh, the legal basis, the retention period, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, no matter if the processing is based on consent or not. Um, so, um, but in order to be able to uh, have all this information handy, um, you can use the consent form um, wizard. Uh, now, you might be interested in the fact that there are indeed exceptions uh, from this right of information uh, for research purposes, um, but they are not that easily available, the exception. So, uh, for example, uh, this information does not have to be provided if, it, if the data were not collected directly from the data subject, but from another source, and providing information to the data subject uh, would require disproportionate effort. And there is a three-step test for disproportionate effort that I won't tell you about, but it's quite strict. Uh, for example, if you uh, download data from uh, social media, uh, from LinkedIn, for example, or, or, or from Facebook, um, there is, even if you uh, download millions of profiles and informing all those persons will take forever, there is still no impossibility. Why? Because uh, social media services, by definition, enable you to contact the person quite easily. All right? So there is, you cannot argue disproportionate effort in contacting uh, those person. You can argue disproportionate effort if you find an old data set uh, somewhere in the library and you don't know if the data subjects are still alive or not. Uh, you don't know where they live. You don't, uh, you know, if, especially if the data is old and there are very many data subjects, then you can rely on disproportionate effort and ignore the information to provide information. But otherwise, you always have to provide information. And this is what the consent form wizard can help you with. Uh, all right. Um, you think anything? Do you have anything to add, Walter? You are muted, by the way. Uh, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm having the, the room microphone, so that's that's why my, my personal one is muted. Uh, yeah, I think that's uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, that was the crash course for the through the GDPR. Um, you can find some more information about that. Uh, there has been a handout that. Uh, has, has prepared uh, for a different context, which is very helpful uh, for research and archiving questions regarding the GDPR. You have the link here on the slide. Uh, if you want to look at the GDPR in more detail, you can use the other link on that page. It's actually very well done. Uh, you can also see uh, the various, um, not just the various articles, but actually also the thoughts that went into these articles. Uh, to explain a lot more about how they came to these decisions. Uh, of course, if there are any questions, uh, you can always contact, uh, contact either us at ELDA or uh, Pavel directly. Uh, and you can also check out uh, some of the learning materials and presentations that we've done. Uh, you can find those on the ELDA website. Uh, there's also a tutorial on uh, basic concepts of the GDPR and uh, using the, uh, the Elder Consent Form Wizard uh, on our YouTube channel in both English and German, uh, which will cover a lot of ground that we also 
cover in this uh, in this workshop. It's a video tutorial, uh, so you can find more information there. Um, yeah, I think that's uh, pretty much it for the introduction to the GDPR for now. Okay, uh, so welcome back everyone. Uh, thanks for rejoining us. We're happy to see um, all of you in the physical or almost all of you in the physical uh, conference uh, coming back and also uh, a lot of you in the virtual format. So that's nice to see. Uh, we are moving to the hands-on part of this, of this workshop where we have had some uh, quite intense practical discussion already. Um, and we managed to identify all the issues and all the problems that we have when it comes to data privacy. So now let's move on and uh, learn about the solutions. Uh, we have uh, established that uh, one uh, appropriate way uh, to handle personal data for research purposes lawfully is to collect consent. Uh, from participants in research activities from whom uh, data is collected, but also uh, from participants who participate in other uh, res uh, research affiliated uh, activities. And um, for, for all of these, uh, for all of these uh, contexts, we might need to, to collect consent. And for collecting consent, we might need a consent form. Um, my, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm getting a little irritated because Zoom is screaming a lot of things at me, but I think now I'm fine. Um, okay, so uh, we have established that we might need consent forms, um, but uh, coming up with a proper consent form that fulfills all the legal requirements is a fairly uh, legally complex thing to do and not every individual and not even every institution has the capacities to come up with proper uh, consent forms. So what to do, what to do, thought the ethics and legality in digital arts and humanities working group of the in research infrastructure Daria and came up with a solution. How about we build a little tool to solve this problem? So this is how the Daria Elder consent form wizard was born and we are uh, looking at it right now. Uh, a little bit of context uh, about the consent form wizard. Um, it was uh, um, chiefly developed by uh, Walter and Pavel and uh, myself uh, working together with uh, Norda Chiriak, uh, a programmer at the Austrian Academy of Sciences who implemented uh, all, the, all the legal um, uh, knowledge into a, a nifty little tool that works uh, quite well. And uh, one thing while I'm introducing this nice little tool right now uh, that uh, I realize we forgot um, is that when it was translated, which it has been by now to three other languages than English, uh, we somehow never uh, uh, noted down who did the translations. So uh, here's uh, one thing to put on our to-do list. We are going to uh, find a proper page to note down credits um, because uh, the tool was originally developed in English because uh, our plan was to come up with a with a tool that can be used in all of the European Union and since English is the de facto lingua franca um, despite any English speaking countries being members of the European Union being the European Union um, we decided to come up with an English tool in the beginning but uh, since the consent form wizard has been around for a, a little while now, I think over two years, um, we have uh, we have in the first workshops that we did presenting this tool realized that um, many researchers actually would need a tool like that in their own uh, national language, not because the researchers themselves do not understand the English tool, they do, but uh, one one very uh, uh, practical thing that we also uh, discussed in the in the on-site uh, group discussion in the in the morning session, um, even if the researchers are very comfortable with English and even with English legal ling lingo, um, which frankly not even I'm completely uh, comfortable with. 
um, the research subjects might not be as comfortable in signing any sort of legal uh, paperwork at all. And then if it's not even in their native language, then it becomes really uncomfortable for them. So that is actually one of the main motivations why we decided to translate the consent from wizard into, well, uh, into all languages where we could find a translator. And uh, we've been quite, uh, quite successful, I would say. And as you can see, we have, you can see it up here in the, in the top, uh, uh, area over here where you can switch the language. So by now we have implemented four different different languages and there are more to come. Um, so and if if your uh, if your uh, native language or the the language of the country where you work is not uh, is not here yet, um, get in touch with us and uh, offer us a translation. We are happy uh, to to accept whatever you you can bring. Um, actually, uh, one more thing about the translation of the wizard. Um, also, one more uh, one more round of credits to to Noabert, our programmer. He has actually implemented a very neat interface for translating this tool uh, into into other languages, which is also, um, I think, a, a, a topic that will become more and more important and popular in in the DH uh, overall. Uh, Okay, so uh, enough of the of the introduction talk. Let's get down to business and look at what the consent form wizard does. Um, on the introduction start page, you have some explanations about what the tool is and what it is not. Um, so this is supposed to give a little bit of context, and uh, you can see in this uh, <laughs> in this uh, big uh, type in the in the center uh, that. The consent firm wizard hopes to help researchers to uh, collect uh, to obtain consent forms in a fairly low level way, but this cannot replace proper legal advisement if you feel that there is anything um, any there are any legal aspects to your work that need need any sort of uh, discussion. So um, this tool does not replace a lawyer, but it can aid you. In um, well, in doing uh, research a little more um, more lawfully, a little more ethically than than would be possible for you if you had no resources at all to to come up with such a thing such as a consent form. So the idea behind the tool is that you go through a through a questionnaire where you answer a number of questions about. Uh, what you are planning to do, what kind of data you're collecting and what you're collecting it for. And then after you will have answered all the questions in the questionnaire, the tool spits out a consent form, which you can then take and hand over to uh, the data subjects that you would like to, well, to the subjects that you would like to collect data from. Um, and that is basically what this start page explains. Um, also, uh, since we're since we're uh, actually processing data that you will be entering into the tool, we have to collect your consent for actually processing your data, um, which is what you uh, you which is so you have to give your consent, and that is what you do by clicking enter here. Um, so. Uh, in the first step, you have to choose a scenario uh, that you are using the consent form wizard for. So you might uh, do academic activities such as keeping in touch with other researchers, and you might be using a mailing list or other uh, communication media for that. And if you would like to collect uh, consent from the subscribers of your mailing lists or um, uh, or uh, for, from, from, from similar uh, areas, uh, you have one scenario that you can go through with the wizard where you will actually have um, a consent form for, for, you know, mailing list subscribers to, to consent to the use of their data for being informed about your research activities. You could also um, be hosting an academic event. You could be hosting it on Zoom or you could be hosting it in real life or you could even be doing a hybrid event. All these things are possible these days. Um, and in any case, you will probably collect more or less data about the people who participate in this event. Um, 
in order for you to be allowed to process these data, you will have to collect their consent. And uh, if you actually want to do that, you can also use the consent from wizard for coming up with this. Um, but uh, since we, we did a little survey at the beginning of this day, asking you from what areas uh, of work you come, uh, and most of you uh, said that you came from the realm of research, we will look into the first and probably most prominent and um, most desired scenario that we developed for the consent form wizard, which is um, coming up with a consent form for gathering uh, data from uh, people, living people, for research, uh, for research purposes. So, this is actually the 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 main um, the main objective of the wizard to help you come up with a consent form that you can give to your research subjects. We talked this morning a lot about oral history, um, and also um, I think one one prominent topic we can consider is a collection of language data for for linguistic research and such. Um, so this is actually the main scenario uh, that the consent from wizard is treating. And this is also what we're going to look into in practice now. Um, you can, if you like, uh, follow what I'm saying uh, on your own screen by following uh, the steps uh, in your own wizard, maybe in your own language. Um, but you don't have to do that because you are going to have some time to test the tool hands on later yourself. Um, so I will just start going through, uh, through, through the wizard. So we are choosing our first scenario. We, are, we want to gather data from living people for research purposes. Um, and the first question that you will have to answer is in what way you are planning to, uh, to collect the data. Uh, you might be doing an online survey with your participants, or you could uh, hand out a more, more retro, uh, a written survey uh, and do uh, ask questions that people will have to answer on, on a piece of paper. You might be doing oral interviews or even video interviews uh, with, uh, with people. That is, um, of course, the, the oral history scenario, but not only that. Um, or you might be doing an oral interview and you might be recording that, but you might be throwing away the recording and only keeping the transcription. Um, so let's say in our scenario, we're doing oral interviews and recording the sound. The next question that we have to answer is what type of data we are collecting from the people that we're interviewing. Um, you can see that uh, in this, for the second question, uh, we have a little remark here, which says that uh, you are uh, supposed to be aware that the GDPR requires you to minimize the personal data that is collected um, to what uh, to only what is absolutely necessary for the purpose uh, of your what that you're pursuing. Of course, when you're researching, um, the purpose that you're pursuing is relatively broad. So I think. Um, you wouldn't have to worry so much um, about what about the, the amount of data that you are collecting. But if you were to organize an academic event, that would be a different story. Um, we mentioned this morning that uh, we do not have any business uh, recording information about dietary requirements uh, of people who participate in an online conference because, well, <laughs> we're, we're not sending you sweets. If, if we were, that would be a different story, of course. So for our uh, uh, hypothetical research purpose, let's say we are collecting, we said we're doing an oral interview. Um, so uh, we, are, uh, we are probably not collecting IP addresses of our participants, but we will probably be collecting the name and surname of our participants. We will be collecting their age. Um, let's say their educational background um, and maybe also their email addresses. Um, now, uh, we have these fairly normal types of data categories that we will be, uh, that we might, uh, might be recording, but there are also uh, more sensitive data categories. Um, there are actually sens sensitive data are explicitly defined in the GDPR. 
um, and they have to be treated in a different way than normal personal data. Um, among these are, for instance, uh, information about ethnic origin of people, about their political opinions, um, about data that concern their health. So uh, this is also why we like the, the example with the dietary requirements, because dietary requirements um, could actually um, provide some sort of indication about some uh, medical status, but they might also provide an indication about some sort of uh, religious belief system. So. Um, if your dietary requirement is that uh, your food has to be kosher or halal, this might be an indication um, about your re religious beliefs. Um, and that would make it sensitive data and not just regular data. So let's say uh, we are collecting uh, information um, about our data subjects uh, sex life or sexual orientation because um, that might be connected to the topic of our research. In that case, uh, different requirements apply to the safeguarding of the data, so uh, our uh, consent form will change accordingly. We could also uh, indicate other data categories uh, which we could write into this field if we uh, included more, more types of data. Of course, um, you're not allowed to enter uh, any types of sensitive data into this other field because um, we wouldn't be able to, to actually tell. Uh, and if you didn't choose any of the sensitive data categories but entered them instead in the other field, then the consent form that the tool spits out would not actually consider that you are collecting sensitive data. And, Ergo, it wouldn't it wouldn't uh, be valid. Um, the next question you have to answer is if you are going to be collecting information about third persons. So you might actually ask people about um, their grandparents for some reason in your in your research interview. So um, if these people that these third people that uh, you're collecting data about are identifiable and alive, then you would be operating in a very sensitive area of data privacy and we would not advise you to use a standardized consent form uh, to process the data that you're collecting. Therefore, you would be running into a dead end here in the tool um, and uh, you would need to consult a, a legal expert in order to, uh, to come up with the proper solution to dealing with your, with your data. Um, I know that this might be frustrating to run into a dead end and not be able to continue, but this is basically what the consent form wizard is supposed to, to do for you. So it is not only supposed to provide you with a consent form for your purposes, but it is also supposed to tell you if there is, if there is a, a problematic field with regards to data privacy in, in the research that you're doing. But let's say we are not running into this problematic, uh, into this prob problematic dead end. Uh, in that case, uh, you will have to uh, indicate uh, the purpose of your data collection. And again, you can see that um, I'm going to speed up a little now, that you will uh, get some more detailed information that provides you with some context for the question that we're asking you. Um, so the purpose of data collection for your research purpose data collection could be research or it could be something else. If it's not research, then you're in the wrong place and this tool is not for you. If it is research, then you can continue. Um, so now you can, add some information about your project, the information that you add in here will uh, 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 directly translate into your consent form. So you will actually receive a fully um, filled in text with all the necessary information and you can straight, you can print out uh, the result and uh, hand it over to your data subjects straight away. So we are um, calling our research project ABC. Um, and it is, of course, a research project from the Digital Humanities. And um, uh, our central research interest is, of course, ABC, as the project name indicates. And then we will also have to uh, provide 
a project website. And uh, we're going to use this one. Um, next, it is important to indicate uh, if you are uh, doing research by yourself or on behalf of a research institution, um, because that will, of course, uh, change the legal status uh, of, of the data collection that you are carrying out. So if you are actually working for a research institution and um, implementing your project there, then you are not personally responsible um, for the data processing, but the institution is. So that makes a difference. Um, we are, uh, we are um, just uh, filling in blind text in here. Because the tool will not let us continue if we don't fill in the fields properly. So that's very helpful, especially when you're trying to present it. <laughs> Um, also a very important question is if your institution has a data protection officer. Um, if you have one, you will have to indicate a uh, name and contact address because that person is actually responsible in case of any, um, of any inquiries. If not, you don't have to fill anything in, which is helpful for us right now. Um, the final question that we see now is how long the data will be stored um, in a non-anonymized form. So uh, we spoke before about anon anonymized and pseudonymized and non not anonymized or pseudonymized data. Um, if data is anonymized, it is not personal data anymore. Therefore, it is not subject to the GDPR. As long it is not, as long as it is not anonymized it is subject to the GDPR. Um, and you have to indicate how long you're planning to store it. If you're planning to store it indefinitely, if you're planning to archive the data, then that will send you into a dead end again, because that is problematic under the GDPR. So uh, there is, however, a workaround. And you can say uh, that you're planning to store the data for as long as necessary for the fulfillment of the defined research purposes. And so um, this might be sort of a workaround to even get to the possibility of potentially archiving the data. Um, data sharing is yet another um, um, sensitive area um, defined by the GDPR. So especially if you're planning to share your data outside of the European Union, there is quite a lot to consider. Um, so you will have to find out if you're, uh, if there is, um, if there are uh, um, legal, Walter, help me, uh, upcoming. Treaties. Treaties, thank you. <laughs> you know, with the with the multilingual tool. <laughs> um, so if you will actually have to know if there are uh, actually uh, international treaties with the countries that you're planning to share the data will, with, etc. Um, so this is also an important aspect. Let's say we're not sharing out our, our data so that we can finally come to the end of this demonstration. Um, you will have the chance to review all your answers one final time and then you can finish and you will be presented with a, a proper consent form that you can print out uh, in the way that you uh, that you find it here and hand over to your research subjects to sign. Um, of course, uh, this is now formatted in a um, not so print friendly way. And of course, if you are working for a research institution, you would probably want uh, your research institution's logo on your consent form, etc. For that ca case, you uh, can download the raw text, which you can then format in, in any way that you, that you see fit. And uh, there you go. Here you have your consent form. Um, that's, uh, I would say, uh, the, the first half of our, of our testing session. So you, now you know what to do and how, uh, how the tool works. So I would hand it over to all of you now and uh, give you a chance to uh, test out the Consent Form Wizard, uh, to use it um, to 
come up with a consent form for a hypothetical potential or even actual research project or other uh, purpose that you might might find it useful for um, test it out um, play around a little and um, feedback in what's our plan in about uh, so okay now uh, we will actually an hour. Uh, yes mm. uh, divide uh, the uh, online participants into two uh, breakout rooms mm. 